The spread and impact of the coronavirus has seen the implementation of various forms of managed isolation or quarantine arrangements around the world. This video is all about the different psychological impacts that being in quarantine can have on people, what the causes might be, and what we can do to help minimize those impacts. And I think it's important to re-emphasize this now as we in New Zealand experience a rise in overseas citizens and residents trying to come back to New Zealand and having to enter managed isolation or quarantine, a new lockdown takes effect in Melbourne, Australia and many other places in the world are either easing lockdown and or experiencing rapid increases in numbers of cases of COVID-19 again. you may have noticed I talked about two different terms just then, quarantine and managed isolation. Let me explain what I mean. Quarantine is the separation and restriction of movement of people who have potentially been exposed to a contagious disease to see if they become unwell, so reducing the risk of them infecting others. Now this differs from isolation, which is the separation of people who have been diagnosed with a contagious disease from people who are not sick. But the two terms are often used interchangeably, especially in communication with the public. And we should understand that this could possibly be a point of confusion for those entering managed isolation or quarantine, and also for the general public too. So it's important we're clear when we're talking about this. And actually, we don't know very much about the exact psychological impacts of managed isolation as compared with quarantine from a research point of view. So what I'm going to focus on talking about here are the psychological consequences that may follow for people entering quarantine specifically. So what are the sorts of psychological experiences that people go through when having to go into quarantine like this? Well, it's often unpleasant, as you'd expect. Separation from loved ones, the loss of freedom, uncertainty over disease status, and boredom can sometimes have big impacts. Suicides being reported in the research, as well as people experiencing substantial anger and legal action has been taken following the imposition of quarantine in previous outbreaks. And the evidence seems to point to the imposition of a restriction of liberty and freedom being at the root of this, because voluntary quarantine is associated with less distress and fewer long-term complications. In the specific case of COVID-19 in New Zealand, this may have been made worse by possibly difficult circumstances leading up to returning to New Zealand, including financial distress, multiple cancellations of flights, and uncertain long waits for further availability. Immigration and visa issues in the the country from which they were returning to New Zealand, and negative New Zealand media coverage, including social media, producing a feeling that returnees are unwelcome in their own country. If we look at the experiences of people quarantined during previous SARS outbreaks, over 20% reported fear, 18% reported nervousness, 18% reported sadness, and 10% reported guilt. They also had experiences like confusion, anger, grief, numbness, and anxiety-induced insomnia or difficulty sleeping. During the equine influenza outbreak in Australia, people were quarantined for several weeks because of that disease outbreak. And 34% of horse owners that were quarantined reported high levels of psychological distress, compared with around 12% in the general Australian population. So quarantine is stressful and it is linked to people experiencing a number of different and difficult worries and emotions with sometimes serious consequences. What in particular about quarantine is it that people find difficult? Well this looks like it falls into five different categories. Firstly, the duration of the quarantine. Some studies have shown that longer durations of quarantine were associated with poorer mental health, specifically PTSD symptoms, avoidance behaviors, and anger. And although the duration of quarantine was not always clear, one study showed that those quarantined for more than 10 days showed significantly higher post-traumatic stress symptoms than those quarantined for 10 days or less. Secondly, fear of infection. People in many studies reported fears about their own health or fears of infecting others and were more likely to fear infecting family members than those who were not quarantined. They also became particularly worried if they experienced any physical symptoms potentially related to the infection and fear that the symptoms could reflect having the infection continue to be related to psychological outcomes several months later. Three, frustration and boredom confinement, loss of usual routine, and reduced social and physical contact with others were frequently shown to cause 
boredom, frustration, and a sense of isolation from the rest of the world, which was really distressing to those people who were in the research. Now, this frustration was made worse by not being able to take part in usual day-to-day -day activities, such as shopping for basic necessities or taking part in social networking activities through the telephone or the internet. And the ability to get outdoors, to exercise and exposure to natural light and surroundings also possibly falls into this category too. Fourth is the issue of inadequate supplies. Having inadequate basic supplies, for example, food, water, clothes, or accommodation during quarantine was a source of frustration and continued to be associated with anxiety and anger four to six months after people were released from this quarantine. Being unable to get regular medical care and prescriptions also appeared to be a problem for some people too. Now, some studies found that supplies from public health authorities weren't sufficient. People reported receiving their masks and thermometers late or not at all. Food, water and other items were only intermittently distributed and food supplies sometimes took a long time to arrive. And the last category, number five, is inadequate information. Now, many research participants cited poor information from public health authorities as being particularly stressful reporting insufficient clear guidelines about actions to take and confusion about the purpose of the quarantine. After the Toronto SARS epidemic in Canada, participants perceived that confusion stemmed from the difference in style, approach and content of various public health messages because of poor coordination between multiple jurisdictions and levels of government involved. Well, what about when people leave quarantine? What's likely to make things worse after they complete their required time? Financial loss can be a problem during quarantine with people unable to work and having to interrupt their professional activities with no advanced planning. And perhaps having been in limbo for weeks or months before entering quarantine when they cross an international border in these COVID-19 times and the effects appear to be long lasting. The evidence from previous research is that financial loss as a result of quarantine created serious socioeconomic distress and was found to be a risk factor for symptoms of psychological disorders and both anger and anxiety several months after quarantine. And then we have the issue of stigma. Stigma from others, often continuing for some time after quarantine, even after containment of the outbreak, is a major issue. In a comparison of healthcare workers quarantined versus those not quarantined, quarantined participants were significantly more likely to report stigmatization and rejection from people in their local neighborhoods, suggesting that there is a stigma specifically surrounding people who have been quarantined. So general education about the disease and reasons for quarantine and public health information provided to the general public can help to reduce that stigmatization. And that includes through the media too. Because it's certainly possible that media reporting contributes to stigmatizing attitudes in the general public. The media is a powerful influence on public attitudes and dramatic headlines and fear mongering have been shown to contribute to stigmatizing attitudes in the past. For example, the SARS outbreak. I'm not saying that the media has been irresponsible, but we need to continue to be careful about how these issues are reported if we want to avoid those stigmatizing attitudes taking root in the general population. So what can be done to protect people from the most psychologically damaging aspects of being in quarantine and what happens afterwards? Firstly, keep the quarantine as short as possible. Longer quarantine is linked with worse psychological outcomes. The longer the stressor was experienced, the bigger effect it seems to have. And evidence from elsewhere also emphasizes the importance of the authorities adhering to their own recommended length of quarantine and not extending it. For people already in quarantine, an extension, no matter how small, is likely to make any sense of frustration or demoralization worse. Secondly, give people as much information as possible. People who are quarantined often fear being infected or infecting others. They also have catastrophic ideas about any physical symptoms experienced during that quarantine period. And this fear is a common occurrence for people exposed to a worrying infectious disease like the coronavirus and might be made worse by often inadequate information people have reported receiving from public health officials, leaving them unclear about the risks they faced and why they were being quarantined at all perhaps. Ensuring that those people under quarantine have a good understanding of the disease in question and the reasons for quarantine and how they should act should be a priority. Thirdly, reduce the boredom and improve the communication. 
Boredom and isolation will cause distress. People who are quarantined should be advised about what they can do to ward off boredom and provided with practical advice on coping and stress management techniques. It is not easy to be locked up in a room by yourself for 14 days. It's also important that public health officials maintain clear lines of communication with people quarantined about what to do if they experience any symptoms, including mental health concerns. A phone line or online service specifically set up for those in quarantine and staffed by healthcare workers who can provide instructions about what to do in the event of developing illness symptoms would help reassure people that they will be cared for if they become ill. And this service would show those who are quarantined that they have not been forgotten and that their health needs are just as important as those of the wider public. And indeed, they contribute to the health of the wider public if they follow the rules. Reassurance like this could decrease feelings such as fear, worry, and anger. An active outreach strategy, that is health services reaching out to those quarantined proactively rather than reactively waiting to be contacted can also help to ensure the safety and sense of well-being and being cared for by those in quarantine. Don't leave it to people who are being quarantined to make the first move. Daily check-ins should be the thing. So to sum up, the psychological impacts of quarantine are wide ranging, can be large and can be long lasting too. I'm not suggesting that quarantine shouldn't be used. The psychological effects of not using quarantine and allowing disease to spread would be worse, as well as the physical health impacts, of course, too. However, depriving people of their liberty for the wider public good is contentious and needs to be handled very carefully. If quarantine is deemed to be essential, then the research suggests that officials should take every measure to ensure that this experience is as tolerable as possible for people. And this can be achieved by telling people what's happening and why, explaining how long it will continue for, providing meaningful activities for them to do while in quarantine, providing clear communication, ensuring basic supplies such as food, water and medical supplies are available and reinforcing the sense of altruism that people should be experiencing. And as well as enforcement of the quarantine protocols, that also goes for letting the general public know about this sacrifice too. Yes, the public may have already gone through deprivations and sacrifice too, so that message needs to be carefully calibrated. But it's a necessary step to help ensure that people feel included and not so stigmatized once they emerge from quarantine. Please subscribe for more videos from me, Saab Johal. Till then, thanks for watching and go well.